What's up, guys? Welcome to Layer by Layer. Today we have a special guest. This is Gabby. She's working on her e-commerce side, and I'll let you just kind of summarize what you're up to. Hi, guys. So I do a lot of your guys' orders and get everything situated on that side. And over the last couple months, I have came up with a bunch of questions for Gabe about 3D printing that I might know, you might not know, and he is going to inform us. Yeah, Gabby helps out with the angled side of everything there. So if you're ever looking at that site or working with the designers or anything like that, you'll probably end up emailing her at some point. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so questions about 3D printing. Generally, we don't talk about like low level 3D printing stuff or like beginner 3D printing stuff, but we thought this would be a good chance to do it because number one, Gabby's totally fresh. So she's got the questions that we might just not think about it because I've been, I've been in the industry for a while now. So we're letting other folks have an opinion of what folks need to know about. So what do we got, like 20, 30 questions or yeah, something like that? Yeah, I think I have 18, couple, couple long questions, some good ones, some deep dive questions. Oh, I can expand, Yeah, I can expand. Um, so the first one, super simple. Um, what is ABS, PET, G, and PLA, and what makes them so different? So ABS, PET, G, and PLA are the core materials that you'll probably run into with 3D printing. ABS is terrible. PLA is always used, and PET, G, people like to use, but really isn't that great. Um, so PLA is a bioplastic made from soybeans very often or any kind of starch based plastic. So basically if you go and you boil flour and just distill it down, you will end up with plastic at the end of it all. Mm. So handy stuff there. Um, even though it is a bioplastic, it's not technically biodegradable, which people often confuse. Um, ABS is kind of the original plastic. It was used for injection molding. It was one of the first ones kind of invented back in like the 60s and 70s and that kind of thing. So everybody has always used it. And when 3D printers were invented, uh, ABS was the first material everybody saw, so they turned it into filament. It's horrible to work with. <laughs> if you are a beginner and you have like an ender or something like that, you should not ever purchase ABS. It won't ever work for you. It generally needs enclosed spaces, super high temps, um, and it gives off all kinds of nasty emissions that you don't want in an enclosed room. Yeah, so it's no. really not very helpful. <laughs> um, pet G is cool because Pet G is basically what disposable water bottles are made out of. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff that you will get is recycled. So it's, it will be like a blue tint natively and then people add in colorant. The problem with PETG is that number one, it absorbs a decent amount of water and it strings really badly. So tuning your print settings around it so you can get a good, nice, clean print like this is actually pretty tough. These rollers are done in PLA because they're indoors and easy. Um, almost none of those materials are very good <laughs> for anything, but they're generally used as like kind of common, common use materials that can kind of catch everything, but like most multi-tools, they, they do they're everything, but they're not good but at But they're anything. not good at what they really do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you had to pick a favorite filament to use, what would it be and why? Ooh. We got a video coming out about this. Um, there is a perfect 3D printer material that mm -hmm. can do everything and is really, really good. And it is TPU. Uh, TPU is a fantastic material because it's super strong, super durable, UV resistant, uh, sticks together, has great layer adhesion, it makes really good strong parts, and it looks really good and prints pretty nicely. Uh, the problem is, is that it's soft, it's rubber. Mm. TPU is thermoplastic urethane, um, but it's all the rubber that we use. Um, so you can't do hard stuff, okay. um, but you can make TPU harder mm -hmm. and manufacturers just don't because people are not ordering it from them. Um, it's, uh, TPU is rated on a durometer scale, mm -hmm. which is the stiffness. So 60D is kind of the average that everybody gets or 95A is what everybody gets. Um, but you actually want to go even higher than that mm -hmm. to where it's almost as hard as the, the sole of a shoe or more. And then you can make stuff like this and nobody will really notice. Um, so if more manufacturers made hard TPU, it is a fantastic material, super safe to work with, really easy to work with. Uh, the reason people don't is because it's actually pretty tough to make. Is it pretty expensive? It is, um, it's not too expensive. It's pretty common, but it's just oh, difficult to make because when you have something that compresses, mm -hmm. like rubber, when guys are running it through the extruder, it compresses and then it squirts out a little bit and then stops and then mm. squirts out a little bit and then stops. And not that consistent. Kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's not consistent. Dang. It's kind of, it's kind of rough to work with, which is why we don't really extrude it ourselves in our filament lines. Um, so what are the different kinds of printers that we have? We only have one type. We have the slant boxes mm -hmm. and we have two sizes of those, but they're the exact same machine, just taller and shorter. Um, the printers that exist, uh, you have the different processes, which are SLS for lasers. You have uh, 
resin based, which is like an iPhone sitting underneath a vat of liquid. And then you have FDM, which is filament deposition, which is a hot nozzle squirt out plastic that we use. We only use FDM here. So Gabby's only had to interact with FDM. Um, those are the, the other ones are the common processes of powder, uh, liquid, and then yeah, filament. Inside of filament, there's bottomless pits of different types of machines. There's everything, the R, uh, there's the standard Cartesian, which is like a Prusa. There's Core XY, which is like a Bamboo Labs machine. Uh, and then there is, uh, there's Delta, which you'll see around, which are like spidery looking mm -hmm. ones. Uh, and then there's, it, oh, if you guys wanna see something really cool, Really cool ones for the mechanical engineers out there. Gabby actually probably won't care about this. <laughs> but um, there's one called a trip to run, which you should look up. Just Google it on YouTube and look at the design. It is not, we, I'd love to build a trip to run just for fun because it looks really cool. Um, and it's actually a Cartesian machine technically because it just moves in three directions, but it looks really complex and really cool, but it's really not. Um, but yeah, there's bottomless piles of machines. Everybody's inventing a new one every day. So if you were gonna recommend a beginner to 3D printing uh, a printer, you would go with an FDM printer? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mm. No, Are you, you're like, I'm not recommending any printer to anybody. I'm not gonna recommend any printer brands to anybody because um, everybody has their ups and downs and that's not what we're about. But um, our printers are amazing. Yep. But <laughs> the, uh, um, as far as like the style of process, FDM is cleaner, easier, cheaper to get a hold of. Uh, resin is also pretty easy. So, and you can make like little miniatures or like jewelry mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So it's like handy. So it's kind of what you want to do. If you're the average DIYer who's like doing a wood shop or have something in your house, you probably want to use FDM. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, what is an STL file? I get asked this pretty much every day um, by people in the outside world when I tell them I work for a 3D printing company. And I'm like, yeah, we have our STL files. What, Still don't know what they are. What do you tell people you do at here, or what? What do you tell people we do um, in the outside world? We're uh, in Boise, Idaho. There's not a lot of 3D printing. Around not here. at all. <laughs> I tell pretty much everybody when they ask. I say I work for a 3D printing tech company, and we make um, headphone and like gaming devices. And then we have the other side where we make things for the um, other businesses around. And people are like, great, cool. And then they're like, so what else really do you do? And I just say, um, <laughs> I pack things. I work on a computer a lot. So talk to customers all day. That's, yeah. that's pretty much what I do. I talk to a lot of customers. Yeah, that's fair. It's like, it's a typical e-commerce job it's most of the time. super typical e-commerce e job. Where it comes from is a little bit odd. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but uh, Or people okay. hear where we're at when I tell them where I work up. They're like, oh, that's quite industrial. Oh, the, the for, actual for space, tech. the, the train yeah. factory right here. Yep, yep. Yeah. They're like, that's yeah. industrial for a tech company. Not a nice, like, big building. And I'm like, oh, it's... It's yes. a big building. We've got tons of sleeping cubbies uh, and rugs <laughs> and a chef on a site. All that kind of, yes, all the things. Um, that's fair. Yeah, it's tough to describe what we do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But we, we're a mass production 3D printing company mm -hmm. is the short one. But, uh, oh, what was an STL is what we were STL talking about. STL file. Um, an STL stands for stereolithography something or another. It might just be stereolithography file. Um, but it was invented by the first company to make the first 3D printer. Um, and an SDL file is a 3D model file. It's made up um, of, when you look at the model, when you've opened up SDL files and looked mm -hmm. at them, you see the 3D model, that is actually several million small pyramids that are all joined together to make that model. They're just super small, so you can't see them. Okay. Um, so they're basically 3D pixels, and an STL is made up of all of those 3D pixels that are in the shape of pyramids. Um, and that is what an STL file is, is a way, a, a nice, low-effort way of moving 3D models around. Interesting. Um, further note for everybody out there, if you are sending us a project, we prefer step STL OBJ. If you send STL and OBJ, send us the dimensions, please, because we don't know how big they are. But steps are universal, and if you need us to do CAD work for you, we need the step file. Don't send us the SolidWorks file or anything else. We're not going to be able to edit it because the software will never match. But uh, send us the step file. Next question. <clears throat> this one I actually got from our uh, computer guys downstairs. Should you be concerned with UFPs and VOCs coming out of the printer? And if you were to be concerned about them or someone, how would you protect, protect against them? Okay. 
So these things are something that's very misunderstood most of the time, the emissions of 3D printers. Uh, UFPs stand for like ultrafine particles and VOCs are volatile something or another somethings. Um, number one, we don't use materials like ABS very often, uh, which are the ones that give off a lot of that crap. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that uh, these materials, uh, these have always existed and are not unique to 3D printing. Injection molders have had dealt with these for forever and you put a big fan in the place and you're generally fine. So long there, as there's free airflow or a large airspace, you're good. We are in a very large building with a lot of free airflow. <laughs> it is not a problem for us as far as density of them. Um, and even in the context of the print farm as a whole, even if we sealed up the building and closed it up, the emissions from the machines is so small compared to like an injection molding mm -hmm. thing that it's it's still nothing. Lastly, inside of our factory, we actually have uh, active filtration that is rotating through the air, which we mainly do to just reduce actual dust. Because again, we're in Boise, Idaho. There's a lot of farming around and we are actually very close to a cement factory. <laughs> so there is no way that our print farm is re releasing more stuff that's hurting our lungs than the stuff yeah. in the world around us. <laughs> so uh, the UFPs are a thing to be concerned about if you're like trying to run a number of printers inside of like your apartment. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, for for us, we have all the systems in place and have the infrastructure around it to where there's enough free airflow. Uh, we don't use nasty materials um, like ABS. ABS, if, if you come to us, we're going to really try to not have you do APS because it's really not mass producible very often. Um, so it just isn't a material that we use very often. Um, so we don't use ABS. We have lots of free airflow and we have active filtration and all that kind of stuff too. Awesome. So, so a lot of coverage on there. Um, how is filament made? So filament is made exactly the way a 3D printer prints. Um, you have a hot tube, you put in beads in the back, the beads are shoved through this hot tube, they melt out, and then they squirt out the end as filament. And that's where you're, where you're gonna add your color? Uh, no, the, uh, the color is added uh, in the beads themselves. So like, actually oh. we had a pile of these beads right here, let's grab that. Um, when we have, Gabby's got really long fingernails. I'm really scared that she's gonna puncture this bag while she's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these are colorant beads. Um, these colorant beads, we've got the raw resin beads, which are kind of transparent-ish. Um, and then you mix this in with those, and then they all just go through in a big old batch, and they mix together more as they're melted. So the more of this you would add, the, the more color the you're color. gonna see. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. White is actually terrible and horrible, because number one, it, you see every other color in it. So mm -hmm. if we have to like run black before this, then our lives are miserable because there's yeah. gonna be like a several lots of pounds of wasted stuff. It's yeah. like gray. Gray, gray, <laughs> light yeah. gray. So when we're running, this is also why like in our extrusion lines, we only do black, gray, and white because mm -hmm. you have the three ratios there. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for making filament, you just run it through a hot tube and filament comes out the end. It's tough to keep it precise, mm -hmm. really tough to keep it precise. But uh, it's doable, and that's what we're doing for our filament brand coming out. Which, by the way, just this week we had a really big breakthrough on that, so there'll be updates coming on that pretty soon. That's a good question. I didn't know that was going to lead into like a product announcement, that, I know. tease, or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is G code? G code um, is machine control code, which comes from CNC machining. Uh, when CNC machines first started getting running, I don't know who invented G-Code. If anybody knows who invented G-Code, comment down below. Um, but it's just little small text commands of like three numbers with letters in front of them, and they tell the machine where to move. Oh, so it's what makes the shape. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I didn't even know G-Code was a thing. Heard it yesterday. <laughs> uh, what are the different build plates? Oh. Uh, there's a bajillion different build plates. Um, the build plate is generally what uh, is, is what the part is stuck to on an FDM machine. Um, generally, it applies t some type of texture. I assume we're talking about the different textures. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, you can use glass. You can use a number of different types of plastics. You can use raw metal, depending on what the plastic you're printing with is. Um, very recently, there's been a lot of build plates come out with like medium texture, high texture, um, like kind of diamondy. I don't even know how to describe it. Like faceted, mm -hmm. kind of faceted. Um, so uh, there's a lot of them around and coming out. We use plain glass and a, a special blend of uh, kind of a, a fiberglass that we use that has uh, properties that we really like and we've got tweaked just the way we want them for auto ejection. Is that gonna um, make it smooth? Is that why people use different? 
The uh, the glass, yes, makes it glass smooth on the bottom. So mm -hmm. whatever your build plate is, the part will match that. Mm -hmm. um, we use, yes, the glass and then our, our smooth plates there. For the mechanical properties they do, generally we don't consider the first layer of a part to be customer facing. So mm -hmm. you want it to be hidden, you want it to be sitting on a desk, you don't want it to be a thing people have to look at. Yeah. Um, so we kind of assume that because the textured beds that arguably look a little bit better, aren't viable for mass production because a person when a part is done a person has to come by and pluck it off and for it like off. things like this you're going to spend 12 years of people picking pieces and that doesn't work if you want to make a hundred thousand yes yeah. because you'll spend a hundred thousand hours working, working on, on them we want a machine to just shove this off and move on to the next one um how does auto ejection work i'm going to dance around this slightly <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, auto ejection is a 3D printer removing the part on its own. Um, uh, a lot of people have created versions of this that use like a robot arm that go by and pull the part off. Okay. And technically we're working on a version of that too. We have a mobile ro uh, a couple mobile robots in our uh, factory uh, and we're going to be putting arms on them so that they pluck parts so that when a part can't be shoved off, it moves on. Uh, the machine itself has to be designed for auto ejection. You can't get it off the is shelf. Is that when it just flies off? The machine? Uh, yeah, if the yeah, if it just shoves it off. You don't want it to fly off. That there's a problem somewhere if it's flying <laughs> yeah. off. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we engineer our machines to have ejection mechanisms on them so that they're actually physically able to basically grab or shove the part off into a bin underneath the machines, cool. so that we can mass produce. I was always wondering why things were flying off. There's some pieces <laughs> that are worse than others. Right now, down in the factory, we got these little itty bitty pieces that pop off the bed mm -hmm. when they break loose. Um, so they do tend to go flying and we they haven't do. put up the shields so that they fall into the bed where they're supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your tor turning point to get into 3D printing? Oh, I hated 3D printing. 3D printing was stupid. <laughs> um, 3D printing for, was stupid. For all the reasons. I own mass production 3D <laughs> printing. It's stupid. Yes, that's, it totally was. Until we came along and fixed it all. Right. <laughs> it's like, um, no, when I... Uh, I was exposed to printing back in 2010, 2012, when it first started like becoming consumer-based, mm -hmm. um, and I hated it. I thought it was dumb. Uh, the reason I thought it was dumb is because it was coming out when I was in engineering school, mm -hmm. and what all my peers would do is be like, oh, we gotta make a plate with a hole in it. Let's go 3D print it. And I was like, why? Let's cut out a board and drill a hole in it. Yeah. This is not this is not a 3D printing required thing. So the fact that it turned into this catch-all, it's this multi-tool mm -hmm. where everybody's like, let's shove everything in there. I was just like, yeah. this is stupid. Because 3D printing is not a catch-all tool unless you know what you're doing with it. Then mm -hmm. you can make almost anything you want with it. But most people yeah, take a wooden dowel and say, let's 3D print this. And I'm like, mm -hmm. go cut it off of a stick someplace. Um, so I hated printing for that because everybody was using it wrong. Uh, but then I also hated it for all the properties that everybody whines about right now. So yep. layer lines, strength of Z, so on and so forth, all those things. Uh, the reason my mind was changed is because in 2015, 16, uh, I was working at another company called Slant Concepts um, where we did product design mm -hmm. and we had created this small little robot arm toy. Oh, yeah. Kind of on a whim. Uh, and we put it on Kickstarter and it did really well, so we had to make a whole mess of them. Oh, no. uh, but we had designed it to be 3D printed because we thought we were gonna make like two and move on with our lives, or hoping it was gonna fail, yeah. and we would move on with our lives. Um, but we had to buy a bunch of printers to make those parts, and they were terrible, it was miserable, it was awful. Um, but in working with those machines, we saw, okay, um, there is a way to fix these, so mm -hmm. that it could be good. And the, the math worked out to where it was like, there's no reason that 3D printing should be more expensive than any other process. Right. Because with any other process, you have plastic and then the electricity to melt the plastic, and then you have to get a mold, and then you get a ship, and then you store it in a warehouse for 12 years, all this other stuff after you right. put electricity and plastic together. With 3D printing, you just have electricity and plastic, and then the part comes off done. And you're done. And you're done. It's funny that you say really cool. 2011 when they all started coming out and you got introduced to it, because. 2011 was also when I was introduced to it, but I was in <laughs> like seventh, sixth or seventh grade, and I was in typing class, and our typing teacher had really? a 3D printer, and I remember it, and then getting coming to Boise and then getting this job, we all thought it was so funny that I had one interaction with a 3D printer in my entire life. I'm not a tech person. I don't understand it. 
and now I work with all 3D printers. Why did you work here? Why did you take the job? I, this might be the wrong spot to like ask, <laughs> ask this out of the blue, but why did you end up here? Um, you had I, other options. I saw the, yeah, um, I had a, quite a few other options for different ways to go, my education and different licenses I had. Um, but I have always been told the tech industry and anything that's going to have to do with uh, kind of broadening is going to be my best bet. Um, I also was really tired of a job that didn't offer any further education. I felt like I knew everything I could know in my other job. Um, and then this kind of came up. I love working with customers. I also love a job that does give me the opportunity. If I'm not super happy doing one piece, give me something else to do, teach me something. Um, and this opportunity fell in my lap. And consistently since I've started, I have learned something every single day and gotten a new skill that I can take out and tell people about, which is super fun. I think it makes me a little bit more interesting when I'm out and I can be like, yeah, something about 3D printers and people who work in tech, they're like, a blonde talking about a 3D printer. <laughs> she, she knows. So. That's not that weird. We got lots of blondes around here. What kind of, what blondes do you know are talking about 3D printers? Oh, not talking about 3D printers. No, no. no. We have lots no. of blondes in Boise, though. Yeah, it's like the central for that. Yes. It, yeah. Um, but yeah, and this job, it's it's a new, you walk in and you're doing something different every day. That You're never going to walk into the same kind of chaos. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Never the same type of chaos. It's never the same type of chaos. Yeah. So, really fun. <laughs> um, let's see. What was my next one? Where was I at? We were talking oh, um, about pursuing 3D printing. What are some considerations to keep in mind when choosing a 3D printer for personal or professional use? Oh, I think personal 3D printers are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> if you're, <laughs> and I, I am on the record about this multiple <laughs> times, by the way, so I don't care. Um, Personal 3D printers are like having a bandsaw in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. If you're a normal human who just wants a, the thing, you're, it's like buying a bandsaw. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a toy, it's not a blender, it's not a microwave, it's not something that you're just gonna grab and use, and I think that a lot of people misunderstand that. Mm -hmm. But if you're like handy, and you're a DIY type of a person, then they're super handy, and they're mm -hmm. a nifty tool to have around. Um, but if, what was the question? What is the advice for buying a 3D What are you going to, what would you consider, what considerations would you keep in mind? Oh. Like if someone came up to you and said, I want to start mm. a 3D printing company. Oh. What, can, uh, what are you question. going to tell them? It's hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if you're starting a 3D printer company, it, it like, it's not fun. A 3D print farm is a terrible, nasty, little, horrible, no good, very bad thing. Um, he loves his job every day, though. Every day. Every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> um, I love the people that I work with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, no, a print farm is really hard because you have a thousand things that can break mm -hmm. at any given time. That's the problem with a print farm, and that's why we built our own machines, so that we could eliminate things breaking. Uh, if you're getting into it on yourself, you're going to deal with that reliability issue because... Printers off the shelf are not designed to be uh, industrial machinery. Mm -hmm. um, they're meant to be user friendly, and user friendly is very much not helpful yeah. in an industrial <laughs> setting. Um, so, yeah, if you're trying to go into the business, you really need to know what you're getting into, and it's going to be a lot of effort, and everything is going to break in a year. Okay. Like everything is going to break in a year. Um, and then, so you got to fix it all or keep it running. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, if you're a normal consumer, just decide you really want another tool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what, all the hobby effort that comes along with it. Oh, yeah. Because it's not plug and play. No. Um, what is the biggest 3D printing misconception? And if you have like a favorite thing, if you told somebody, I own a 3D printing farm or I 3D print, what is your favorite comment like back from them when they say that? When they say that? Or when you say that? When I say that and somebody says a comment back yeah. to me. Well, I don't know. I have to think about that for a minute. But uh, what was the first? I had the first part of that question. What was it? Um, the biggest 3D printing misconception. Oh. Biggest 3D printing misconception is scale. Everybody's like, oh, you can't make 100,000 parts or 1,000 parts or a million parts or whatever else it was. Totally you can. Do it all the time. <laughs> um, the, the, the 3D printing has as much scale as any other mass production process, and a lot mm -hmm. of people don't realize that. There's nothing stopping it except process and reliability control, which is about building a factory. It's, more, it's about building the factory, not building the machine. It's about building all the systems around the machine. Mm -hmm. um, as to comments that people have said to me when I said I were at a 3D printing farm, Especially people in the tech industry. 
oh. who know about 3D printing. They know the work it takes. I think we just have to like read our YouTube comments. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, well, should we just screenshot and put that <laughs> clip right there? That might be the thing to do. Um, most people misunderstand the size of print farm that we mm -hmm. work at here. I like, did, oh, I did you got like 10 that. printers or whatever else it was mm -hmm. in the garage. And like, no, we don't have 10 printers yeah. in the garage. I think my favorite comment um, that I see all the time is uh, you explaining the process if we're doing like a CAD video mm -hmm. and then someone going in and explaining it, but completely wrong, but you're wrong. Like they'll I'm, come in and get, no, not you're wrong. They're wrong. The person commenting, uh -huh. but they're like, you're wrong. This is actually oh, how this process works. The you're wrong comment. Yeah. It, it blows my it mind. It is hilarious. It's so good. Uh, but nobody ever watches, knows what the whole channel does. So they mm -hmm. watch the one video and they're like, oh, no, no, you yep. can't do that. Why are you saying mass production, 3D mm -hmm. printing, that kind of thing? That is pretty funny. Um, Especially but, on the TikToks, the shorts. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because no one goes and watches the full video. So they watch the short of yes. like the handles. And oh, yeah. they're like, why would you make a handle like that? That's not usable. But if you watch the whole YouTube video, we clearly say it's not usable. Wait a second, what is not usable? Some of the handles, like some of the handles, you can't just use some of those handles. Oh, you're those talking about the cup video? Yeah. Oh, that got people, that ruffled mm -hmm. feathers. Oh yeah. yeah. But they're all usable. They're all usable. Yeah. They're all usable. They're all fine. They're mainly though, to be fair, yes, they were meant to be like a, a design mm -hmm. exploration if I was being pedantic about but it. But of course, but, everyone has to be like, you can't use those. Yes. We're telling him you had to use them. Let me address this though, because <laughs> I am going to address the commenters. Everybody said like the coffee mug handle mm -hmm. is perfect because it's been around forever. That literally means that it, that's like saying a horse is perfect because it's been around forever. That's why we should never drive cars. Right. It's like, yeah, the horse has been around forever. So what? Um, the fact that a coffee mug handle has been around is just because it's based on pottery mm -hmm. and not because it's ergonomically better than anything else. We right. Got. It's just the lowest water has flown downhill to that spot. Yep. At the moment. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that's my response to all those comments. <laughs> on the video. Um, what industry do you think will benefit most from 3D printing? Oh. Cosmetics, toys, cars. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of them because it changes everything. Mm -hmm. It breaks everything. Right now, everybody is used to going and getting a million parts made over there and then figuring out how to spread them all around. Mm -hmm. Whereas with 3D printing, you make the part when somebody makes an order. So mm -hmm. there's, uh, in, in a perfect world, that's what we're all pushing towards with the printer, uh, uh, warehouse where the shelves make the product. Mm -hmm. um, it breaks all of that because you don't have shipping, you don't have molding, you get to change products all the time. So it applies to everybody from <laughs> massage rollers to yeah, cosmetic uh, packaging mm -hmm. to automotive, all that stuff. Um, so I don't think anybody's gonna go untouched by it. Um, if you're making fewer than a million parts per year, you're definitely going to be affected by 3D printing. That's, that's the cutoff, regardless of what the industry is. Really? Um, so there's that, and then, but short term, the ones that are probably gonna be most affected are gonna be print on demand. Mm -hmm. Cause everybody right now is printing logos on t-shirts and mugs and stuff, and all of our underwear drawers are full of that crap. So yeah. the printing gives people the ability to make something new and original, mm -hmm. um, very affordably, and print it on demand. So it's really easy. Um, so that will be one of the first industries to really flip and just like fully absorb 3D printing. So it'll be like YouTubers and you have print on demand guys that you see online and that kind of stuff. So cool. Yeah. All the YouTubers are gonna have so much cool merch coming out. Yeah, they will actually. Um, Sooner than a lot of folks. Do you think 3D printing impacts the environment? And if so, is it going to impact it negatively or positively? Wildly positively. Mm -hmm. um, just from an emission standpoint, 3D printing is better because of parts made today, 15 to 25% of them are never sold, mm -hmm. which means that number one, you wasted the energy of making and transporting all of those. And then you're gonna go and throw them in a hole somewhere or reprocess them or recycle them if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. But you eliminate all of that waste that currently exists. And then the other positive benefits are that there'll be actually less utilization mm -hmm. because you don't have to have that upfront transport that existed either. So instead of moving a million parts all over the world, if you have a lot of distributed large factories that are like Amazon fulfillment centers full of 3D printers, um, then you're basically teleporting stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's less transport cost there. Um, and you don't have to make the mold, which is another piece of waste and very energy intensive, all the rest of this stuff. There's just huge number of savings because you're only putting in electricity and plastic and then you get the final part when somebody wants it. Awesome. So yeah, it's, it's big, 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 good. Save big, the good. earth. Big, good. All the penguins. Um, what do you think the future of mass production, production 3D printing will look like in the next, 
The next three years. Oh, three years? Oh, that's easy. Um, there's going to be, uh, for us, we see it as large print farms strategically located as fulfillment centers, a warehouse where the shelves make the product. So for us over the next three years is that we have the Texas factory coming up in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have two more factories in the States at least, uh, maybe three, uh, that will happen in those next three years. And then we'll have two international at least in those next three years. Um, because it gives all of our customers who do currently do print on demand or production, just they get up and closer to production. So there's less shipping cost, there's faster fulfillment and people can reduce the volumes that they need because they don't have to worry about it schlepping across the world mm -hmm. um, for a half a year or whatever it happens to be. So um, the future of mass production 3D printing is also going to be distributed. Print farms have a huge advantage because they have a high reliability. Mm -hmm. If a printer breaks down, oh no, we lost one printer out of 3,000, yeah. who cares? Um, whereas folks who are focusing on like the large massive machines, uh, if that machine goes down, well, your whole factory just went down. Yeah. So it's just an injection molding thing in a different suit. Yeah. Um, so print farms are way more robust, even though they're, they're more, a diff more difficult system to create, mm -hmm. but we've solved most of those problems so far. Do you think a lot of people will see where mass production 3D printing is going and try to jump on getting a 3D printing farm going? I in the next so. couple of years? I hope a whole bunch of print farms pop up. Um, right now, we're like the only ones, um, for better or worse. Yeah, um, we're number one. <laughs> yeah. There were several guys who started up print farms before us, um, Shapeways, Voodoo, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and all of them kind of moved away from it because it's it's brutal. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you make it work, it works really well. Um, I hope other people open up print farms, but pr print farms are tough. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's not about a bunch of printers on a shelf. It's a whole system. So mm -hmm. you've got to build a whole factory or find a way of getting there. Um, so I hope more people do it. I'm sure more, there are print farms out there that are making like individual products, like mm -hmm. lamps at Gantry and that kind of thing. Um, uh, you should watch our video about Gantry and those guys, by the way. Um, but, uh, they're always focused on a single product, which is mm -hmm. way easier than like print farm oh, as a service. Yeah. Cause when a random thing comes through our door, it's a whole new monster to have to deal with. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how many more people go the service route. A ton of print farms will pop up for individual products continuously because awesome. it's a really good way of making stuff. Cool. Can't wait to see that. Um, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of 3D printing compared to a traditional manufacturer? If we were talking about like toys specifically, what are the main advantages? No mold, less shipping, less waste. Um, so you don't have to buy the mold up front. So your startup cost went from $100,000 for that tool to like maybe a couple grand mm -hmm. to design it and go on from there because you don't have the mold. Uh, you have less shipping, so you don't have to schlep something over from China over to here or anything like that. Um, or you're able to do in batches. Mm -hmm. uh, you have less warehousing because you don't have to make a whole big old volumes of it. Right. Because it can pretty much be made on demand in batches. Like, oh, you need 1000 every month, not $12,000 all at once for the year. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what was the other one I said? Oh, the efficiency. Like I said before, like 15 to 25% of all products go unsold. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's Barbie this Christmas. There's going to be a bunch of them <laughs> not sold. Um, so printing is able to make on demand and match the demand much more closely without mm -hmm. giving people supply chain anxiety of like, yeah. Am I going to run out? We can't have the shelves run out. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the you just have huge efficiency there. Awesome. Yeah. Um, how does the slicing process work in 3D printing, and why is this so important? The slicing process is converting an STL, or some associated 3D model file, to G-code. Um, how it works... I don't know. I haven't looked under the hood at most of those things. <laughs> um, they basically take the outer part, sides of the part and just turn it into those G-code commands. Okay. So that the nozzle of the machine follows the outline of the 3D model with some other magic thrown in there to make other things happen. Does Do all 3D printed, like, like our heads and like these, do they have to be hollow or can you make it to where these are more solid on the inside, making them stronger. We can make it totally solid on the inside, doesn't make them that much stronger. Mm. Um, you can think of a 3D printed part like an I-beam. Mm -hmm. When you see an I-beam up in a building, most of the strength you've got, uh, I want, I need a shape, I need tools. You've got an I-beam sitting here, and we'll imagine that there's a flange on the bottom too. The things on the top and the flange on the bottom are the ones doing all of the heavy lifting. Okay. This is just there to hold them. So this is like the same as the infill, and this is like the skin of the 3D printed part. Okay. So making a 3D printed part totally solid doesn't really increase strength very much, because if it breaks through the outer layer, if you start splitting on the outer layer, it's going to go all the way through the infill. Mm -hmm. um, so 
a high infill is literally all you need and you st get to use less material because like on these kind of things if we were making this with solid material this thing would weigh like two pounds yeah. of plastic but right now it weighs i don't know two ounces um stupid light uh, um so um going for solid 3d printed parts generally isn't necessary because it doesn't really give you very much hmm. i didn't know that I was asking Chris, I was like, I think we need to make these solids so they're weight bearing. Oh no. He was like, they're weight bearing. You can stand like, on right I was now. like, okay, yeah, good. You great. want to stand on? I'm going to stand on. Right now. <laughs> Gabe's going to stand on. You're not going to be able to see him anymore. Actually, actually, I do feel a little bit scared about this because I am a. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. That's not going to go because I am, I'm pretty darn heavy, but I could lay on it mm -hmm. and no one else is going to like put their full 200 pounds on top of nope. this thing in a focused way. Um, cause it's a massage roller. Why are you standing on it? Yeah, don't stand on the massage um, rollers. But, uh, they will hold up to a lifetime worth of use. Wow. Of normal use of people pressing on them, the mm -hmm. way you're supposed to. Like this, you know. An average person, and it's not King Kong. It's not King Kong. Yeah. You all those bodybuilders. Yeah. Game. They're <laughs> not them, King Kong. <laughs> some of them are very big. I have ranching muscles, them bodybuilders don't scare they, me. They, they don't stand a chance. <laughs> Those are all my questions. That's it? That's the whole thing? That's the whole thing. Well, cool. That was a, that's a long podcast, so that's fine. I don't I understand it. I told Chris. Uh, I was like, this is going to be long. It's going to be good. We got Well, sweet. Well, that's all we got then. Well, thank you, Gabby, for coming by. Uh, of course. I'll be yes. here next time for you guys. Yeah, we'll do this again. Comment down below if you want to see more things like this, of like uh, going through basics of 3D printing or just question and answer kind of stuff. Uh, let us know what you think of Gabby. You know, she's around. She likes good comments. Be positive. Be nice. All those things, because she's <laughs> awesome. Um, and that's that. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.